free energy and electrochemical potential. A couple of things that we already talked about from chapter 18, that is the free energy is uh, available work that a system can do. And what you'll find out in this particular chapter, that available work when it deals with electron transfer is called electromotive force or the electrochemical potential. So that's, that's basically what we are doing here. So electromotive force, and I sort of alluded to this last time, it's kind of like potential energy that's been uh, translated to electrons moving in a wire. So the reason why you see that waterfall is because it's um, the work that water can do, like it can spin a turbine or a uh, water windmill when that potential energy is converted to kinetic energy. So we can generally call this energy, this electrochemical potential, um, EMF, electromotive force. Okay, and it's a form of energy, and we can think of energy in terms of in this particular work, in this particular circumstance, the work per charge, the work per charge. So, if we know how much charge we have, that is, we we know how many electrons are flowing, we can actually calculate the work. So, again, the work would be like the energy that you can obtain from a system. So that's what we are looking for. So in this equation right here, you can see right away that we have this equation. The energy is equal to work per charge, but charge is Q, okay? Q is what we define in terms of charge. You also found Q back in Chem 200, where Q represent heat. Here, Q, it represents charge. I know we have limited alphabet, and so we, sometimes we use uh, a symbol for, for multiple meanings, but it's based on the content, okay? So we got to remember that when a system does work, then it releases the energy. So that's why we have a negative sign here, okay? We have a negative sign there because when the system releases work, it's like an exothermic reaction. An exothermic reaction, it releases work. Uh, energy is a product, likewise here. That's why we have that negative sign there. And then we can take this Q value and then expand it, okay? The charge is based on right here, the number of moles of electrons times the Faraday constant. So we Faraday's constant is a constant. It's 96485 um, Coulombs per mole of electrons and N depends on the reaction that you, you guys are investigating, the number of electrons exchange. So we can plug this NF in here and get this value right here. And this is the classical example that you see that is related to free energy. And this is just nothing more than delta G. We can just convert work maximum, which is the work available, which is the free energy is equal to minus NFE. So you see this equation a lot Okay, you see this equation a lot where delta G is equal to negative N, that is the number of electrons, exchange F, which is a constant, Faraday's constant, E, which is the electrochemical potential, okay, for, for whatever system that you're reading. So let's go back to this equation again. W max equals minus N minus Q E max. E max, again, is your electrochemical potential. Okay, so that's the, the um, generally the, the potential for the cell. Maybe at standard state, maybe not at standard state. When it's not at standard state, we have to make a correction. We, we, we will look at that again shortly here, okay? Um, so this right here is, um, we use 96485. That's what I learned, but some books use 96500. Um, Try and use the more precise value, 96,485. If you get away with 96,500, you might get rounding off errors, okay? But maybe your book used 96,500. I always like to use the more precise value, 96,485 Coulombs per mole of electrons, okay? So um, you can see right here that um, it's basically that substitution that I have that I showed you 
earlier. That's this. And uh, before I move on, before I derive this equation right here, okay, and if this is zero, this is zero as well, I want to do a sidebar. And what I mean by sidebars, I just want to elaborate on this concept right here of 96, 485 coulombs per mole, the charge um, that you use when you calculate the work. And that's because uh, you see this as well in maybe physics, but it's something that is important. You probably see it in your final, if not in this next exam or this next test. Um, in terms of electroplating. Now, I, I know we skip 19.03, uh, which is electrolysis. You should go back and review that. But in electrolysis, what you do is you, you have a piece of material and you have a solution that has some metal ions. It could be nickel, it could be silver. And what you do is you plate, say, that metal, let's say silver, on this piece of metal, maybe a utensil like a fork or a spoon, okay? It's made out of stainless steel. But you, what you wanna do is you wanna coat it with a silver layer. Well, in order to do that, that's not a very spontaneous process. You actually need to put in energy for that reaction to occur. So it's called electroplating and uh, that's an electrochemical process. To solve problems like that, you need to understand the concepts of um, Faraday's constant, as well as dimensional analysis. So I want to kind of sidestep a little bit and just uh, review these types of questions so that you are well aware of how to approach these problems. Now, the key to doing these problems is not understanding anything new. It's actually about doing the fundamentals that you learn in science, dimensional analysis. Okay, dimensional analysis. And what I'm going to do is show you an example in which I don't know what equation to use. Okay, all I know is that I need to figure out what mass of silver is going to play it out based on the parameters that's given. So let's take a look at this problem. We have this problem right here and the problem states, the amount of metal plated can be calculated based on stoichiometry. Okay, so whenever we have stoichiometry, always think about moles, moles of whatever reaction you are studying. That's the basis of stoichiometry. Reason why we use moles is because it's too difficult or it's too tedious to get to the molecular level. So what we do is we ramp up to 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. It's basically looking at uh, individual molecules or particle, but at a bundle. A, mole, a bundle of moles, okay? So let's take a look at this problem. We have one amperes. An ampere, remember, is the um, current. If, you're, if you took physics, there's going to be a current, which is like the pressure that the electrons impose on a wire. Again, if we think about electron flowing in a wire, we think in terms of water flowing in a pipe, the Amperes is like the, the, the um, amount of uh, water or the amount of electrons that are going to flow through that wire. And then voltage is the amount of force that is going through. So we have voltage and we have um, current when we think about electricity. Well, here we have ampere. That happens to be a current and it, is, um, it has the symbols coulombs per second. Okay, coulombs per second. And then we also have Faraday's constant. We already looked at that, 96,485 coulombs per mole of electrons. And then for this particular problem, we're looking at silver. So the question is, silver is electroplated. So what we have, maybe we have a spoon, okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to put silver ions to silver metal on that particular spoon. Okay, and this is through electrolysis. So the question is what mass of silver plates if a current, so what we have is a current and that would be um, in this particular case, 6.8 amps equals the um, current. 
And then amp, remember, is coulombs per second. So keep that in mind. Um, 6.8 flows through a cell in 72 minutes. That's the time. Okay. Now I'm putting current and time here, but I don't have an equation. The key that I want to illustrate to you is you use the units that you are given to solve this problem. You use the units. And believe it or not, that's how many of you are going to get bailed out on problems that you don't have, you don't have a clue on which equations to use. You go back to the fundamentals of dimensional analysis. So from this particular information, you can figure out the mass of silver. And then the question is, what electrode will play it out? What electrode will the silver play it out? So the reaction is this right here, silver going to silver zero, because you're plating out something that means that it's going to be a um, neutral metal. To balance this equation, you need an electron here. And you can see that this is a reduction reaction. The silver plus goes to zero. So right away, you know that the electrode is going to be the cathode. Reduction at the cathode, oxidation at the anode. Always keep that in mind. Oxidation at the anode, reduction at the cathode. So right away, we can answer that second question. What electrode will the silver play it out on? The second question is, um, and here's where you need to start using information that you know, but you don't realize that you need, it'll be a discovery. But once you see these types of questions, then you'll know what type of other information you need to bring in. So this right here is equal to 6.8 coulombs per second, okay? The other thing that you need to remember is you have 96, 485, coulombs per mole of electrons. So right away, you can see that this coulomb right here and this coulomb right here has got, has got to cancel. It's got to cancel. Otherwise, you're, going to, you're, you're not going anywhere. So there's a coulomb, there's a coulomb, there's, there's a time right here, and this is a time. So we need to convert this over to seconds. Here's a mole of electrons, there's a mole of electrons. So right away, you can see the relationship that we're trying to build. We first need the time so that we can get seconds. Then we bring in the current. And then we bring in Faraday's constant, which will give us the moles of electrons. Then we can use this balance equation to figure out the moles of silver. And once we understand that we can get the moles of silver, then we can get the mass of silver using the molar mass. So it's something that you guys really need to train your mind on how to do because it's so fundamental in science using dimensional analysis. So let me show you how this works. First of all, we're going to, um, I'm gonna go the, the long way and actually show you each of the steps. I'm gonna put seven, two minutes here. I'm going to put for every one minute, I have 60 seconds. And then I'm gonna bring in the current for every 6.8 coulombs, I have one second. Okay, so these seconds already cancel. For Faraday's constant, I got 96, 485 coulombs, one mole of electron. And then from the balance equation, I know that one mole of electrons is one mole of silver. And then I'm gonna use the molar mass. I'm gonna say that I have 107.87 grams per mole of electrons. Now, if this was two, let's say there's two electrons transfer, let's say this is plus two going to Z, so that would be there. Then, of course, you're going to put that over here, two moles of electron per silver. But in this particular case, because silver is only plus one going to zero, and you should know that because silver is always plus one, then it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So let me erase that. Okay. And correct that real quick. So when, when you do this math, let me just do this in my calculator. Uh, you should practice it. You see that the minutes cancel out, the seconds cancel out, the coulombs cancel out, the moles of electrons cancel out, the moles of silver cancels out, and what you get is grams of silver. So this answer comes out to be 72, 60, 6.8 times 
96, 485 divide and one over 7.87 times. So I come up with 32 point, the answer comes out to 32.84 grams. Okay, again, just using dimensional analysis. So that's what we see right here. Let me clear my, my right here in terms of the answer. Okay, dimensional analysis. I can't stress that enough in terms of you guys as uh, scientists, because sometimes you don't have the equation, but you can develop the equation just by working with the unit. So I have an exercise for you. Okay, take a screenshot of this. Uh, it's due by 11 tonight or midnight tonight, and I'll give you some points, but do this problem right here. Okay, the amount of metal plated can be calculated using stoichiometry. Copper can be electroplated at the cathode of an electrolysis cell by the half reaction. Copper plus two plus two electrons going to copper. Okay, um, how much time? Would it take to play it out 325 milligrams of copper with a 5.6 amp? So look at this. I won't give you the answer. Oh, I'll put it up after midnight tonight. But turn this in. Um, what I will do is I will develop uh, a link in Canvas where you can submit your, your page. So do that. And again, this is a good problem to solve because many, if you, you're a doctor, uh, yeah, do it individually. Okay, it's due by midnight tonight. Okay, I don't, I don't want to spend time in you guys doing it right now because we got too much to cover. But you can do it after class. And even for those of you who who have lab, you'll still have time to do this. If you understand dimensional analysis, this won't take you more than five minutes. Okay, so. Take a screenshot of this right now. I'll put up a link in Canvas in Chem 201, and then you guys can do that. Okay. Um, it's extra credit, but it's also participation. Okay. So um, make sure you show your work. Let me move on and get back to uh, what we were talking about. So in this particular case, what we have is we now substitute delta G for W max, which is the work maximum. And that's minus NFE. And that's the fundamental equation that relates the electrochemical potential to thermodynamics. And notice there's a negative here. There's a negative there. What does that mean? It means that when the electrochemical potential is positive, delta G is negative. In other words, for the reaction to be spontaneous, spontaneous electron transfer, the potential, electrochemical potential, has to be positive. If it's negative, then that's not the um, spontaneous process. That's not the spontaneous process. A negative electrochemical potential will give you a positive delta G. When the electrochemical potential is zero, then we're at equilibrium. And that's basically what happens to a battery. Okay, Where, uh, When your battery dies, what generally happens is that the um, electrochemical potential is exhausted and you basically have a state of equilibrium at that point. So um, let me go ahead and continue on with this. When we put super zero there, what you have is standard state conditions. Again, remember what standard state condition means. It means 298, 25 degrees, and it also means that we are looking at one atmosphere. And depending on the um, material, one molar solution, if it's a, a solution. Um, so go back to chapter 18 and look at what are standard state conditions. We use the super zero to denote that. Okay, the equation states that the maximum cell potential is directly related to the free energy. Remember that this right here is basically the electrochemical potential at the oxidation plus the electrochemical potential at the reduction. And then you add them up. Or if you do the book and you're reading the values in the table, the standard reduction potential from the table, then it's the Standard reduction potential at the at the cathode. This is the cathode. That's where reduction occurs. Minus 
the standard reduction potential, that is the, the value that's directly taken from the table. Don't flip the sign. The negative here means that the sign is flipped because this is the anode. So when you're, again, I remind you about this over and over again, because this is these, the, the essential uh, of how you calculate the reduction potential. It's basically the oxidation and the reduction. And if you know what the potential is, is, you can add it, or you can use this equation because you're basically reversing the anode potential. Okay, you're reversing the anode potential. Don't mix those two processes. Those two processes are essentially the same, but again, many mistakes are made that, that way. So we can calculate the potential of the cell. For those of you in lab, please, please, please take a look at activity number 11, which isn't, do, which isn't um, required until next week, but it's really good practice for the quiz coming up this weekend. Okay, and if you have any questions on that particular activity, then you can certainly email me and I'll sort of point you in the right direction. But uh, that particular activity relates equilibrium, free energy, and electrochemical potential. So you should be able to complete that activity just based on what we covered in lecture. Okay, so let's take a look at this right here and let's look at a typical example of how to use our, our new knowledge in solving a problem like this. So I give you a problem here. It's the, I tell you that there's two reactions and they're both written as reduction. How do you know they're written as reduction? Look at where the electrons are, are written in the reaction. Gain electrons, reduction. When you gain electrons, the electrons are written in the reactant side, okay? So here, the electrons are here, the electrons are here, it's in the reactant side. So both of this is a reduction. To further illustrate this point, you see that the iron goes from plus three to plus two. That's a lower in the charge, that's a reduction. Here, it's not obvious, but it's probably the silver, I mean the sulfur that undergoes reduction. You can figure that on your own in which the charge goes from a higher charge to a lower charge. The fact that the electrons is written on the left side means that you're um, reducing that charge to a more lower value. So I give you two reduction reaction. Now you can't just use two reduction reaction because you cannot have two reduction in a reaction. They always have to be coupled between a reduction and an oxidation. Two reduction occurring gives you a net electrons on one side or the other. When you have a redox reaction, the electrons have to cancel. You can't have any net electrons, okay? Whatever electrons is being consumed has to be provided by the other reaction. That's how you couple the reaction. You can still solve each of the half reaction individually, but in order for it to work in the real world, you need to couple it so that one's an oxidation, one's a reduction, okay? So let's take a look at this right here. Uh, we have two reactions and we need to figure out what combination is going to work for us. The combination that will work, and please keep this in mind, especially when you start doing the activity, is the one that gives you a positive electromotive force. The one that gives you a positive electrochemical um, potential or the most positive electrochemical potential. Okay, the most positive will be the one that is going to be the one that is going to um, dictate the reaction. If you're trying to figure out which reaction requires the least amount of energy, and when you add the oxidation and reduction, you still need a negative sign, you want to find the combination that leads to the least negative or the, the most positive in terms of its negative value. That's just the way the world works, okay? Uh, more negative means more energy required. So the least energy negative that in combination is the one that's probably going to be the most favorable in terms of uh, committing energy to. So let's continue with this problem. We need to figure out a combination so that when you add the two, 
you get either a positive or the, the least negative. If I reverse this number right here to minus 0 0.77, that, that is make the first reaction an oxidation rather than a reduction. And I keep the second one, then you can see that's a minus 0 0.17 volts. It's not a spontaneous process, but it's going to be 0 0.17. Let's reverse the second one. If we reverse the second one and keep the first one at, as is, then I'm going to get positive 0 0.17 volts. So that's basically it. What we're going to do is we're going to reverse this reaction. This will be now the oxidation re reaction. And this will stay as the reduction reaction. And when we do that, the voltage that we will get is 0 0.17. It doesn't matter how many electrons are involved. The potential is independent of the stoichiometry. All you need to do is add the electrochemical potential. Okay, like for example, if we multiply the top one by three, do we, we multiply 0.77 by three? No, we don't. Because what happens is that it's going to be 0.77 times three divided by three, because now we're dealing with three electrons. So it's going to cancel out, okay? It's an intensive property. That is, it's independent of size or the amount. Please keep that in mind. When we reverse it, we change the sign, but when we change the stoichiometry, we don't change the magnitude. So that's basically it. We now know that the electrochemical potential for this particular cell and the reaction is going to be this. Iron plus three going to iron plus two. There's two electrons here. And then we're going to reverse the second one. We're going to have 2H2SO3 going to S2O6 minus 2 plus 4 hydrogen plus 2 electrons. OK, now I forgot that's not 2 up here. Let me erase that right there. OK, now what you see right here is we got to make sure that each half reaction is balanced. And then what we need to do is make sure that the electrons cancel. So let me show you that real quick. Let's make sure that each half reaction is balanced. So we have an iron here and an iron here, one to one. And we got one electron here. And plus three and negative one is positive two, positive two on the right side. So that's OK. The top one is balanced. At the bottom. We have four hydrogens. We have four hydrogens. We have two sulfurs. We have two sulfurs. We have six oxygens. We have six oxygens. So in terms of elements, they balance. In terms of charge now, we've got a plus four here, minus two and minus two. It's zero on both sides. Okay, it's zero on both sides. So, so the charge also balance. But when we add the two, what you end up with is more electrons on the right side if we don't correct the top reaction. So what we need to do is we need to multiply this by two. So now we have two here, two here, and two here. And then when we add them up, the electrons will cancel. So the net reaction is two Fe plus two plus two H2 SO3. Remember, this is not sulfuric acid, it's sulfurous acid goes to 2Fe plus 2 plus S2O6 negative 2 plus 4 hydrogen. As a last step, make sure you double check your equation. I've got two irons here, two irons here, four hydrogens here, four hydrogens here, two sulfurs here, two sulfurs here, six oxygens, six oxygens. Last thing you should do is balance the charge. We have plus 4 here. Here we have plus four minus two. Um, let's just make sure we got plus four here. And we have plus four here. I'm missing something. Minus two plus four. Um, oh, this is plus three, sorry. So that's plus six. OK. Don't, yeah, thank you for, for pointing that out, Daniel, exactly. <laughs> so that's plus six. Here we have plus four, uh, plus eight, 
plus eight and negative two, that's plus six on that side. Always uh, go back and check your work. You work so hard in getting to that point, And then like me, you do a dumb error by writing down the wrong charge. Um, it's going, it's, it's mistakes like that, that you start kicking yourself when you get the answers to an exam because it's an easy oversight and yet it's easy, easily correctable if you just double check, okay? So that's the balance equation. Let me clear this out and let me show you how to calculate free energy from this, okay? So we're calculating, um, remember that the potential here is gonna be positive 0.17 volts. So we're gonna calculate, that's E0. So we've answered that free energy is equal to minus NFE, N is two. And how do we know that? We balance the equation and we saw that there was two electrons that you needed to cancel both sides. E is 0.17. So let's just um, carry this out. That's um, minus two moles of electrons times 96, 485 coulombs per mole of electrons. Okay, times um, 0.17 joules. Remember, a volt is equal to joules per, per coulomb. Look what happens. Your coulombs cancel, your moles of electron cancels, and you get your answers in joules. So if you do that math, and you should practice this, what you get is 296.485 times 0.17 times, you get a total of 32,804.9 joules or 32.8 kilojoules, okay? So the fact that it's positive potential means that there's a negative here that I forgot to carry down right here, okay? It's a negative free energy, 36, 32,804.9 joules. Now let's figure out what my K equilibrium is. Um, and let me uh, clear a space up over here. So K equilibrium, remember from thermodynamics, delta G equals um, minus RT natural log K equilibrium. You should look at that in chapter 18. So right away, I know that this is 32.804.9. Always carry as many significant figures in the in-between calculation. That way you don't get rounding off errors. Okay, the reason why I'm keeping it in joules is because R equals 8.314 joules. You gotta make sure that the units are the same. If you mess up in the units, you're going to be off by a factor of a thousand. Uh, if we rearrange this equation, what we have is negative delta G over RT uh, is equal to natural log K equilibrium. In order to get rid of this natural log, we raise it to the E power, okay? And then what you can do is, uh, what you can do is, um, sorry, that was my phone. Um, rewrite the equation and say K equilibrium is equal to E to the minus delta G over RT. Okay, so we're gonna use that in terms of the uh, equation to calculate delta uh, K equilibrium. Let me clear a space over here so you guys can see this. And you can see that the, math, the, the concepts are not difficult. It's just making sure that you apply the right equations and the, the right equation, at least for these parts, are already given to you, okay? So K equilibrium is equal to E. And remember negative, um, and it's a negative, negative and a negative, because the answer was negative 320, 32,804, negative 32,804.9. So negative 32,804.9, that's joules over 8.314 joules 
298 is the standard temperature. So that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to take this answer that's in my calculator. I'm going to make this a negative and a negative. Okay, a negative and a negative. And then what I'm going to do is, um, hold on, seems to be a problem here. Yeah, take care of something real quick. There seems to be a message that I need to uh, address. Uh, give me one minute. Okay. Huh. Where's that? Anyway, we have uh, 32804.9 divided by 8.314 divided by 298. And so that exponent is 13.24 positive. So we're going to raise it to the e power. And I get K equilibrium is going to be 562,837 or 5.62 times 10 to the uh, fifth. Okay, that's the answer that you guys should be getting in doing the math. Again, the math is not difficult, but you need to practice it so you don't make silly pun uh, punching errors. Okay, you need to um, just do that and that's basically what you see in my answer right here. Okay, um, I think these are the answers. 32.8 kilojoules, uh, that's 5.62 depending on the rounding off. Um, let's see. Okay, that's fine. Um, you should be able to get those answer. Remember, a positive electrochemical potential, a, a positive electromotive force will always give you a negative free energy. A negative free energy means that the, your K equilibrium is going to be very bit positive. It's not going to be less than one. Less than one means that the equilibrium is generally shifting to the left. Uh, Something in the magnitude of 10 or 100 or 10,000 means that the equilibrium shifting to the right. All of these magnitude are consistent with each other. Positive electrochemical potential, K equilibrium that's much, much greater than one, a negative free energy. They all should be consistent. So make sure you know how to do a problem like this because what you will see is that you can be given any one of the three you can be given a free energy and you're going to be able have to calculate the electrochemical potential and equilibrium. You might be given a K equilibrium and you need to calculate the electrochemical potential and um, the free energy. But you have access to all of those if you know the equations to relate one to the other. And of course, if you know the conditions that is, it's at standard state. If it's not at standard state, then we need to apply a correction. And that's what we will look at shortly here. Okay, that's what we're going to be seeing. So um, that's where the NERTS, or some people call it the NERD equation, but really it's called the NERTS equation. It's by this guy, uh, Walter NERTS, and he related how you can calculate the electrochemical potential based under non standard state conditions. Okay, based on non standard state conditions. And it goes like this. Okay, uh, first of all, just some review here. And the review is that when the electrochemical potential is, when you have a reaction in which electrons are going to be um, uh, transferring spontaneously, then you get an electrochemical potential. What happens in a chemical reaction, of course, is that the products are going to get consumed and the reactants are going to increase. So what happens initially, just based on the fact that the, the products are the ones that are going to be supplying electrons okay, to the reactant, as long as there's um, a good amount of products 
sorry, the reactants are going to be the ones that are going to be supplying the electrons. The reactants are going to be the one that's supplying the electrons to make that rea reaction go in the forward direction, okay? So as long as there are sufficient amount of reactant, that electron transfer will proceed. But what eventually happens is that the reactants are gonna get consumed and the products are going to be increased. And what happens is that the driving force for that electron to transfer are going to start diminishing, okay? Remember that when you have one molar concentrations, you are at standard state. But generally, you don't start at one molar concentration. You start at a higher level. That way you have more potential to drive that electrons. Of course, when it goes down to one molar, you are now at standard, standard state. And then when you drop below one molar, what happens is that the electrochemical potential starts to decrease its standard state value. So th that's what this particular slide is illustrating. When reactants greater than the product, then the electrochemical potential will be large. It would be larger than the, the standard state conditions or equal to or larger than the standard state conditions, depending on your concentration. When the product is larger, so now you build up products and the reactants is lower, then the EMF starts de to decrease, get smaller, okay? so. Remember what we talked about in chapter 18. In chapter 18, we said that, oh, maybe we have a free energy, non-standard state, non-standard state. And so we don't put a super zero there because it's not standard state, but it's equal to delta G standard state, where we put a super zero, plus a correction. And that correction was RT, natural log Q, where Q is the products of a reactant. So just a reminder of what we talked about in chapter 18. Well, guess what? We can use that same equation to figure out what is the equation to use when we're not at standard state for electrochemical potential. So that's basically this equation right here. But what we're going to do is we're going to substitute delta G equals minus NFE we're going to substitute NFE for delta G. So that's what we are doing here. And so what you see here is for here, we substitute NFE. For here, we substitute NFE super zero because that's standard states. And then we still keep, keep RT natural log Q, okay? So our generic derivation for non-standard state conditions in terms of electrochemical potential is basically derived from the free energy correction. We have this equation. Again, R is 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Okay. If you're using liters atmosphere, you're using uh, 0.08206. But since we're using joules, it's 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. That's what you see right here. We can take this equation and simplify it. Okay, what we can do is we can divide by negative NF throughout that equation. And when we do that, let me clear this. This is basically it. If we divide this by negative NF, we get this equation. The electrochemical potential under non-standard state equation um, conditions is equal to electrochemical potential under standard state conditions. This you can calculate based on the tables in the back of the book. E0 is based on the standard reduction potential standard state. This right here is something that you're already familiar with. We covered it in equilibrium. We covered it in free energy. You're seeing it again in electrochemistry. Okay, the only thing that we're adding is NF. That's the only thing that we're adding. So you need to know the moles of electrons that are exchanged in the reaction. That means you need to know the stoichiometry. And of course you need to know Faraday's constant. Okay, so um, that's the equation. This is the most fundamental equation. And since we have electronic calculator, you can always use this equation. Okay, this equation right here. But 
back in the days, and this was like right when I was in high school. When I was in high school, they didn't really have, this was back in, um, I think in the late 70s. They didn't really have calculators, at least calculators at the time were, were really expensive. $100 probably for a $10 calculator uh, that you can buy at uh, CVS these days. Okay, but um, I remember buying a calculator back then and it was pretty cool. Now I didn't have to use a slide ruler for a lot of these functions, but prior to a scientific electronic calculator, that, that's how mathematicians solve log problems and power functions. They use like a slide ruler, okay? Uh, and that's what's happening here, okay? RT, natural log, it's very difficult to solve natural log problem. It's much easier to solve it based, based on not natural log, but log base 10, log base 10. When you can solve a problem log base 10, it takes away a lot of the calculations. So what did they do to the Nernst equation? They converted it to log base 10. And when you do that, you have this correction factor, 2.303. That's why you see it right here. So if you take the same equation, the Snertz equation, and then you convert natural log to log base 10, then you get E equals E0 minus, again, there's a minus there because remember that the electrochemical potential is opposite sign to free energy. That's why there's a negative there. Uh, 2.303 RT NF log, that's base 10. Q. And then you know that R is a constant, 8.314. You know that Faraday is a constant, 96.485. And if you have 298, that could be a constant as well. So what we can do is we can take all this right here and just make that one number. And when we do that, we get to, we get, we derive the classical, the classic equation for the Nernst equation. It looks like this, okay? Looks like that, this right here. Oops, what's going on? Mm. My, my, no, oh, let's see. Okay, if you take um, 2.303, actually this, this should be this right here. Oops, this right here. That's 0 0.0592, and it basically gives you this equation. E equals E0, standard state conditions. This you determine by doing the um, standard reduction potential. 0 0.0592, we've taken out R, we've taken out T, we've taken out F. We put N there because N will always be the number of electrons exchanged. And that whole thing has the units of volts log products over reactant. That's Q. So this is its more refined form, but this is the most generic form. If you know how, um, uh, how to put natural log in your calculator, then you can use any one of these forms. These are all called the Nernst equation. You should be able to recognize them. Okay, it's just that here, we've already put in the value for R. We've already put in the value for, for F. We've already put in the value for T. And then we've changed it from natural log to log. Those are how we get from this generic equation to this equation right here. So why is this important? Because now we can calculate the electrochemical potential when we don't have one molar concentrations, when we don't have, um, the, the 298, if we don't have 298, then always use this equation because there's a temperature factor in there that you can use. Let's take a look at an example, okay? Um, here's an example in which we have zinc going to cadmium plus two. And uh, the reaction is the oxidation of zinc, zinc to zinc, zinc plus two, oxidation always happening at the anode. Right away, you should know. Okay, that's happening at the anode. The other one's a reduction, it's happening at the cathode. Okay, and you first need to calculate the electrochemical potential under standard state conditions. What does this mean? It means that you have to go into the, an appendix or go to a table and 
figure out what the potentials are. I already know that the oxidation of zinc is going to be positive 0.76. We've covered this enough times that I just know that. The reduction of cadmium, I don't know. The other thing you should notice is that they're all one molar. So this is a standard reduction calculation where you don't have to do any correction. The second part is for non-standard state conditions. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so again, this is the reduction. It's negative 0.76. When it becomes an oxidation, you change the sign. This is the reduction potential of cadmium. So the potential, therefore, is going to be, let me just do this real quick. This will be positive 0.76 because this is the oxidation. You see it's an oxidation from the top. And then I'm going to subtract 0.403 from that. Okay. Or you can do this. You can do 0.403 minus a minus 0.76. It'll get you the same answer. It'll get you the same answer. So um, I'm going to um, go ahead and add this up. Um, this is the anode cathode minus the anode. Let's, let's do this. Um, sorry, there's a negative in front of that. There's a negative in front of that. So when I add this up, 0 0.76, 0 0.403, that comes out to 0.36. And you should double check both method. Uh, changing the negative to a positive when you add it up or just doing this equation. Again, don't mix the two method. I can't stress that enough. I say it now, but some of you are going to make that mistake. That's the most, one of the most common mistakes I ever see is that you guys reverse this because it's an oxidation, but you, you forget that you're subtracting it. So you're overcorrecting, in other words. You don't want to do that. This is 0.36, okay? So E0 equals 0.36. So what we're going to do now is calculate the non-standard conditions. The other thing I need to recognize is that there are two electrons exchange, n equals two. And how do I know that? Because there's two electrons on the top, two electrons on the bottom, they're gonna to have to cancel. Remember that oxidation reduction reaction always will put the electrons in opposite side, they'll have to cancel. So when we do that, we know that n equals two. So let's go and do this, E equals E0, that's 0.36, and minus RT NF natural log Q. And what is Q? Q is going to be the products over the reactant. We need the reaction. It's right down here. Let me write that reaction. So you still need to do a balancing act here. And when I do this, I'm going to reverse this right here because remember that that'll be the oxidation. So it's going to be zinc plus two going to zinc zero. And then of course, I'm going to put two electrons over. Put, sorry, that's the opposite. Zinc zero going to zinc plus two. So I'm just going to do that. Zinc zero going to zinc plus two. And that means two electrons on this side, plus two and a negative two zero. When I add this up, I'm going to have cadmium plus two plus zinc zero goes to, in fact, I have it up here. Okay. Um, so I didn't really need to do that. It was already up there. The um, products is zinc plus two. So Q equals zinc plus two over cadmium plus two. Remember that zinc zero is a solid, doesn't show up in the mass action expression. Cadmium zero is a solid, it doesn't show up in the mass action expression. So this right here is products, and the products is zinc plus two, and I know that the concentration of zinc plus two is 0 0.150 over reactant, and the reactant in this particular case is 1.5. And it's raised to the one power because that's the stoichiometry over here. Even though there's two electrons exchange, the, it basically uh, reduces down to a one-to-one -one ratio. 
in its simplest form. So all we got to do now is just plug this in R equals 8.314, T equals 298. It doesn't tell us anything about temperature, so we can assume it's 298. N equals two, and Faraday's constant is 96.485. So go ahead and try that. Take 0.15 divided by 1.5. That gives us 0.1. And then we need to take the natural log, okay? The natural log. And um, that'll be an ln function in your calculator. That gives you negative 2.3. That gives you a negative 2.3. I'm going to take that number, multiply by 298. I'm going to multiply it by 8.314. I'm going to divide by 2. And I'm going to divide by 96,485. And that's, uh, let me make sure that I show the full display here. Um, <coughs> negative 2.956 times 10 to the minus 2. So that right there is a negative 2.956 times 10 to the minus 2. A negative and a negative makes that a positive. Okay, because there's a negative in front of that. So I'm going to change the sign. And then I'm going to add it to 0.36. And that comes out to 0.3895. So my final answer is 0.3896 volts. And I'm going to round off to um, the hundredth of a place, 0 0.390 volts. That's my answer for this particular example. Let's double check. I'm gonna clear this right here. Okay, 0 0.390 volts. Again, the math is not difficult. There's just a bunch of calculations, but it's those types of problems that is going to, if you're rushing through it and you don't double check your work, you're going to make silly mistakes down the line. Okay. Um, now, remember when we talked about acid-base chemistry, I told you that the way pH meter work, it's based on the voltage that the solution has. Well, guess what? This is where we look at these types of problems. We're looking at the voltage. So right now, what we have here is this reaction right here, zinc, going to zinc plus two, that again is going to be the anode. So zinc is going to zinc plus two. And then we have hydrogen going to H2. That's going to be at the cathode. That's the reduction. I tell you that the potential for the cell, and you've seen this in the previous, is 0.72 volts. And the question is, what is the pH of the solution? That might be a big leap to go from electrochemical potential to pH. But remember, what exactly is a pH? A pH is an indicator of hydrogen ion concentration. If you know the hydrogen ion concentration and you take the negative log of that, you get the pH. So really, this question is, what is the hydrogen ion concentration for this reaction? Let's, let's take a look at this e equation. We know that this is the potential for the cell. This is actually the potential for the cell and it's not E0 cell. E0 cell, if you go back to this, the chapter is, is 0.76. How do I know that? Because the oxidation of zinc is positive 0.76. The reduction of hydrogen is zero. How do I know it's zero? Because it's the, the reference. We make hydrogen oxidation reduction zero and everything scaled up from there. So Positive 0.76 plus zero is 0.76. So this right here is E0. Let's plug this into our equation. E equals E0 minus, and now I'm going to take a shortcut. I'm going to go back over here and I'm going to use this equation just for the sake of showing you that there's a, a variety that I can use. I'm going to use 0 0.0592 over N times log Q. Okay, I'm going to use that. 0 0.0592 over N log 
Q. I know what this is, this is 0.72. I know what this is, this is 0.76, positive. I know what this is, if you go up here, you see it's two electrons. I need to solve for Q. Q is products over reactant. So if you take a look at the reaction right here, let me clear this up for you. The reaction is going to be, let me just do this. Uh, one half of the reaction is this. The other half reaction is this. I'm just gonna write this out. Okay, two positive here, two negative there. Yeah, that's that's the reaction. The two H plus plus two electrons goes to H2. So Q is equal to the products zinc plus two times hydrogen. These are generally gas. Now, this is where you're going to be a little bit confused and it's okay, I'll try and explain that. Over reactant, and the only reactant here is hydrogen squared, okay? You need to, to know the concentration of zinc, you need to know the, the concentration of hydrogen, and it's written over here. It tells you what the concentration of zinc is. They don't tell you the concentration of hydrogen because that's what you need to solve. And then the partial pressure of hydrogen is one atmosphere, one atmosphere. Don't ask me why, but in this circumstance, the atmosphere is blended into Q. Remember Q is sort of unitless anyway, depending on the atmosphere. I know that atmosphere molarity doesn't cancel. It's just that uh, it's okay in this particular setting. Okay, it's okay in this particular setting. There's more details than that, but I don't really wanna get into PCAM of this. Just know that if you have atmosphere there, it's okay. So this is our Q value. We know what this is. This happens to be um, 0 0.10 molar. This is what we need to solve for H plus because that's the unknown. So this is really is nothing more than an algebra problem. Let me set this up for you and then I'll show you the answer. I'm gonna erase all that. So what we have is 0.72 minus 0.76. Take this over here and then divide by 0 0.0592. And then we multiply this by two and that's equal to log Q. If we take all, all that and raise it to the 10th power, what we get is Q. Because remember the inverse of log is 10 to the X. So I'm raising this whole quantity, 0.72 minus 0.76. Um, and then there's a negative here. The negative here means that when you bring the negative to the other side, negative 0 0.0592, there's going to be a negative in front of 10 to the X. Don't forget your signs. Those are typically where easy mistakes are found. And this is equal to um, 0 0.10 over H plus squared. So that's, that's the math. All you gotta do is simple is do algebra. Let me show you how that works. I'm gonna clear this up for you. Okay. See, this is Q, N is two. I go back here and I take minus 0.72, minus 0.76. There's a negative in front of that. Two over 0.0592 still the same, is equal to 1.351. So the negative and this whole quantity becomes negative is 10 to the 1.351 is 22.46. And now this right here, the 10 and the 10 here cancels out each other. We're solving for H plus. So when we do that, we bring um, H plus to this side 22.46 on that side, and h plus squared is 0 0.00445. Again, this all of this is just algebra. And if we take the square root of that, we get 0 0.0667. And then if we take the negative log of that, we get a pH of 1.176. The solution is acidic, okay? 
So this is a problem. This is an example that you really should should study because this is a problem where uh, you're giving the electrochemical potential, you can actually calculate the pH of the solution. And that's how our electrode works. We're not actually using zinc. We're actually using silver, silver chloride in, in that reaction for, for our electrode, but um, it'll work depending on what you're coupling the hydrogen electrode with. Take a look at that. Uh, again, this is a really good example, and I think you've got homework problem that does this. This shows you the relationship of free energy, electrochemistry, and K equilibrium. Don't forget as well the Nernst equation. E equals E0 minus RT NF natural log Q or minus 0 0.0592 over N log Q. And you guys know how to solve for log Q because you have seen it since equilibrium. It's products over reactant, okay? Um, me do, that pretty much wraps up this particular section in electrochemistry.